Did you have premarital sex or did you wait until marriage? Oh, I did mention that earlier. No, I did not have premarital sex. Okay. You are an exception because pretty much every single person I've to be on this topic has said, yeah, you know, I had premarital sex, but then I changed my mind after I got married. So, okay. I'll give you props for at least uh, being consistent with the stuff that you say. Hey, everyone. I wanted to share with you some clips I had from my recent dialogue with Alex from Playing With Fire. He's a self-described sex and dating coach, takes a very secular view on these matters. So we were dialoguing about the issue, is premarital sex bad? In particular, is premarital sex bad for men? So we discussed that. I hope you enjoyed these clips. If you want to watch the entire dialogue, click on the link in the description below. Fair warning, though, there is a lot of crude language and subjects that do come up in the full dialogue. So if you want to watch it by clicking the link below, just keep that in mind. So without ado, here is my dialogue with Alex on the ethics of premarital sex. Is it unethical for a man to ask his wife for permission to be in an open marriage or to have a threesome or for him just to have an affair? Is it unethical for him to even ask that? At what point in time? Before marriage? After marriage? After marriage. Is it on? I don't know if it's like full on unethical. Uh, I think it's not ideal. I think that yeah, I think, okay, you can make the arguments unethical because basically the girl is under the impression that you're going to have like a very standard, straightforward, monogamous type of marriage. And then you're basically, after you're getting married, uh, you're especially assuming that also she's the type that waits until uh, marriage to have sex. And then she gives you her ultimate gift, as I think a uh, woman in that position would view it. And you're like, hey, by the way, can I other girls? Uh, just that question in of itself would be insulting, just like I'm sure it would be insulting to you if your wife was like, hey, Trent, I love you, but it's okay if I have the occasional threesome with a bunch of dudes. Like, So yeah, you can make the argument that that request, it would be insulting. I don't know if it would be like fully unethical. It depends on kind of how you define these things. Well, uh, I, and here I'm going to say that I think my view that what sex is for, and then maybe after I reply to this, you can give me your answer to that question better explains not even that it's unethical, but that it would be just straight up immoral for a husband to ask his wife, hey, can I have an affair with somebody that he is just flagrantly asking to do something against the very core of what their marriage is, that it's not just, well, when we got married, there was an understanding we would be monogamous. And now you're breaking that. And that's not the plan that I had. That's a minor way to look at it. That'd be like if a husband asked his wife, hey, is it okay if I take this job and we're going to have to move to the other side of the world uh, to do the job? When I'm sure when they got married, they had an implicit understanding they would live on their side of the world, uh, where even if there's an implicit understanding, oh, it's okay, let's ask. And if that's bad, you know, I'm not really feeling that, but I'm glad that you asked. And yet the implicit understanding with sex is just very different because deep down people know that marriage, that sex is for expressing marital love and that marriage is supposed to be in monogamous as part of our human nature. And there's something deep within our human nature that no amount of propaganda for open marriage or anything like that can absolve saying what the, what this is for. It built into just the very being of who we are. Yeah, but it's not like that with just sex. Like it would be this similar effect if the husband was like, hey, is it okay if I become a stay-at-home bum? Or hey, is it okay if I don't contribute to the kid's well-being at all and you pay all the bills? Both of those would have a similar type of outcome, which is the girl. But, would but notice in those, in those examples, he's asking to do something that's objectively bad. But you don't think that sex outside of marriage is objectively bad. Well, if we rephrase stay at home bum to stay at home husband, I don't think that's objectively bad. Right. I think that. that and I, mean, I, and I don't think. And I don't think it'd be unethical for him to ask to do that. It's certainly not like asking to have. Well, I'm not saying it would be unethical. I'm saying it would not. It would be kind of insulting, right? And that's what that's the argument I was making is that it would be kind of insulting a lot of marriages if we were to do that. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily like objectively unethical. Uh, and I think there's certain insulting questions you can ask your partner that would just piss them the fuck off, right? Okay, let me try to think of another analogy. Another one could be like, hey, so let's say you marry um, a girl who, I don't know, let's say she suffers some hyperthyroidism and she's a, like a little bit overweight and she's tried to lose that weight. She can't. It's like, hey, by the way, can you get to single digits body fat? Like she'll probably find that insulting, right? Or let's say, I don't know, uh, you have, uh, you're bald. Uh, you know, uh, and she's like, Hey, can you wear a wig from now on? Like you might find that insulting. So there, there's, there's multiple things that partners can find insulting 
uh, it, it's not just sex related stuff. Well, yeah. And I, but I would say that asking to have an affair is, it is insulting, uh, but then it goes far beyond that. And the examples you gave are interesting because in asking a spouse to change their physical appearance, that in itself is kind of a, a breaking of the marital vows. If it's done for like a vain reason, uh, that you, you in the marital vows and what's important here and why I think premarital sex is bad. What's important about marriage is that you promise to be monogamous and spend a life together with someone till death do you part. Uh, even if, for example, that the other person gets sick and or disabled and they can't have sex anymore there, you don't just say, well, you know, sex is it's just so important to me. I, I, I got to go. You say, hey, you know what? We're married. I'm in this for the long haul in sickness and health, richer or poor, we're in this till, till de death does us, us part. So you cherish that other person, regardless of who they are and, and what they become. Everybody gets older, frumpier. Uh, and so it breaks that minor vow of loving someone as they are, but the major vow is just not having sex with other people. So it's insulting, but because it's, a, it's the core element of what makes marriage, it goes beyond just insulting to being immoral to even ask to do such a thing. Yeah, but it would be a lot more understandable to ask if you can sleep with other women if your partner, for, for example, becomes crippled and she can't walk, right? And it's been going on like that for five years and she's incapable of having sex. At that point, it becomes much more understandable. It okay. can still be offensive, but it becomes much more understandable to make that request. That's, in fact, when you see those situations, when you see like uh, someone, you know, for whatever reason can't have sex, right? Typically, you see a much higher rate of that person having sex with other people, right? And a lot of the sure, times- Sure, just, just, yeah, just, like, just, like just like abortion in the case of rape, is in one sense more understandable than abortion just being used as birth control. But from my, well, from the objective moral law perspective, not just my perspective, both are equally wrong. Actions can be equally wrong, even if one might be more understandable than another. The question that you raised earlier is what is sex for? And sure. so my answer is that sex in some ways is just like working out. It can be used for a lot of different things. For some people in terms of working out, it's a lifestyle, right? They live for that right for some other people it's a fun hobby and some others do it purely as a way to stay healthy and they hate it right and i think it's the same thing uh like that for sex in some ways for you sex is something that's about uh it seems like you're already married so it's about uh maintain it's about either having children or maintaining a strong bond with your partner okay that's totally fine that's one way that one thing you can use sex for for someone like me who's in a you know in a relationship i'm not married it's there's some similarity there it's not to have kids but it is to uh number one uh have a very pleasurable experience and number two uh keep a strong bond with my girlfriend but me like four years ago right when i was a lot of girls left and right it was for a way to have fun it was a fun pastime kind of like uh watching football for some people you know i hate sports or uh, you know, like pain, playing paintball or something along the lines of that, right? So what sex is for depends on the person, just like what going to the gym is for will depend on the person. Uh, so yeah, there's no easy like universal answer to that. It just depends on the person. But there's multiple things that sex can be used for. And I would argue that if you are using sex outside marriage, doesn't mean you're misusing sex. Okay, so you would say that sex isn't for anything. Uh, it's just something that people do because they enjoy it for different reasons. No, I think that what I said was sex can be used for multiple different things, not just for the things that you mentioned. Right. It's it's not for any particular thing, uh, just like. Um, well, it's not. No, but it's not for any particular thing. It's for some particular things. Right. So, for example, what sex is not for, it's not as a way it should not or at least it should not be used as a way to. Um, you know, like uh, it should not be used as a way to, uh, let's say, manipulate the person, right? That's what I think sex is not for. Or what is it not for? It's not a form of, I don't know, uh, let's, let's say something like it's not it's not for, uh, I don't know, like uh, improving your brain or something like that. So there's there's many things that sex is not for, right? But it is for some things and what those things well, are. Well, when you say like improving your brain, you mean that in a non-moral sense. Not that it's wrong to try to do it to improve your brain. It's just not going to achieve that goal. It's not going to achieve that, exactly. Okay. So the yeah, so first it's not example was more of a moral argument that it shouldn't be used for controlling someone or manipulating someone. But would you say that you should never use anything to manipulate other people? That it's not sex that's unique in that area? 
Yeah, I would agree. Like with you that. shouldn't manipulate people with love. You shouldn't use friendship to manipulate people. Yeah. So like sex fair. isn't unique in that respect. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. So I so I, I think that when you look at that, if if sex has just a subjective purpose to it, that for some people it can just mean the whole world to them. And for other people, a guy who just has sex with a different woman every night because he likes it, it's it's a recreational activity on par with going to the gym. I would say that sex can't have an objective meaning to it if everybody has a subjective uh, meaning for themselves. It just has no objective meaning. Everybody has their own subjective understanding for that. But I just don't think that that corresponds to what most people understand about basic sexual morality. You don't have to be religious to believe in sexual morality. If you think it's wrong to uh, commit adultery or be uh, unfaithful, uh, and not just because you've broken a promise, but because that particular action is worse than it, and most promises you could break with someone. I think that has to do with what sex is. Or, for example, like we have like we have an entire code of law dedicated to sex crimes. Like you can you can go to jail for a longer period. You can have a harsher punishment for having sex with an unconscious person and not causing visible or not even let's say sex, let's say fondling, fondling an unconscious person. And so you don't even leave a bruise or any marks on the person. You could go to jail longer for that than for punching somebody in the face for causing more visible harm. To me, the only way that could explain why the law would step in and regulate that is because sex has a very specific and important social purpose that's objective. And therefore, government has an interest in regulating it and sanctioning its use in other contexts. Prepared for it. Yeah, hopefully you don't mind me asking uh, this somewhat personal question. But did you have premarital sex, or did you wait until marriage? Oh, I did mention that earlier. No, I did not have premarital sex. Okay, you are an exception because pretty much every single person I've debated on this topic has said, "Yeah, you know, I had premarital sex, but then I changed my mind after I got married." So, okay, I'll give you props for at least uh, being consistent with the stuff that you say. Um, if you were to wear condoms and use them properly, and also if you're really, really paranoid, the girl's on birth control, the chances of you getting her pregnant is like close to zero. It's like zero, zero. You're, you have a better chance of getting hit by a car when you're driving, getting hit by a drunk driver at some point, right? So, of course, with any activity, there's going to be some level of risk. I think we as humans and just sane humans would generally look, okay, is the risk like, you know, is the risk like significant or is it really, really minor? Like, I'm assuming that you're not afraid to go outside because there's a small chance of drunk drivers going to like fucking wear off and hit you. And then if there was someone, if I was like arguing like, Hey, Trent, you shouldn't leave the house because there's a high chance that a drunk driver will hit you. You'd be like, dude, that's a little silly. Like, you know, like as long as I don't walk in the middle of the street, I think I'm fine. It's the same thing here, right? The equivalent of walking in the middle of the street would be having unprotected sex with girls you don't know, right? But if you're wearing condom and also it's a girl, you know, and she's on birth control and there are ways, there are forms of birth control. that are not detrimental to women's health, by the way, it's just also another side note. Uh, then the risk is, insignificant it's just it, it's not there um so yeah so that would be i guess what i would say so i guess i don't know where you want to start off but those are kind of the uh the big points in regards to what you said mm -hmm. all righty well let's there's a lot to go through here so let's go through a few of that let's start with the last one talking about children i don't think that the analogy is on par i see what you're saying that you wouldn't say oh don't engage in this activity because there is a risk of something bad happening. You're correct. There's a risk of something bad happening in any kind of activity. But I think when it comes to sex, it's a little bit different. Like there is a risk when I drive in my car, I will be killed in a car accident. But there, I, my life would be severely, severely hindered if I never got into an automobile. I couldn't go to work. I couldn't go to the gym. I couldn't run errands. So the benefits massively, massively outweigh the risks that are involved. And I, I would say the risk of me being in a car accident are much less than 1%. But if you look at the Centers for Disease Control, for example, the failure rates of contraceptives are anywhere between 2 and 23%. The idea that they're, it's nearly zero, even when you use perfect use, uh, that's implying that you always store condoms correctly, put them on correctly, always use them the birth control pill is always used. The girl doesn't skip a day. That the pills aren't defective. Uh, I, I would say, well, let, let's just say that the risk there of creating a child is, you know, I'll set it low. Let's set it at, um, you know, let's just set it at half a percent, 0.5 percent. Okay, 
So 99.5% chance won't get pregnant, half a percent of a chance. Uh, I would say that the better activity to compare it to might be this. Let's say that people get together and they say, hey, we really like to play a game where it's super exciting. It really like turns us on. We put on bulletproof vests and shoot each other. And we've got these really great bulletproof vests. They only fail 0.5% of the time. So one out of 200 times, somebody gets shot and they die. I would say, uh, I guess it's something you get a lot of joy enjoyment out of, but it still seems like a dumb thing for me to do that you should only fire a gun if you're okay killing the thing that you're aiming it at. And the, the joy from that activity doesn't justify even that small risk for such a serious consequence that's involved, taking a life. Much the same way, you shouldn't fire your member into someone unless you're completely okay with them getting pregnant. Uh, so I think that would be a bit more analogous when it comes to the, the risk reward element. Uh, that, that's just the serious consequence when this happens with children. Uh, I would say that the, the pleasures of sex don't justify the risk that they're putting. And the thing is, when you look in society, it, it's just painfully obvious. 30% of, of kids live without both their mother and father. Uh, premarital sex is, is often a cause of that. I mean, it's not an unheard of thing, you know? Yeah. So I think we have to use statistics correctly. So, okay. So when you say up to 23%, that implies if you're using condoms incorrectly. Condoms, if used correctly, have about a 2% failure rate. And then if you combine that with an IUD, which is not something you have to take, it's something that's literally injected in you, lasts like three to five years, depending on which one you use, that has less than 1% failure rate. So if you want to be extra cautious and you combine condoms with an IUD, you get a, I guess, a risk factor of, I don't know, 0.02%, right? It's less than it's less than a fraction of a fraction of a percent. So if you take the proper precautions, uh, the risk is insanely small. Uh, it, it, it's not it's not half a percentage. It's not even a fraction of a percent. It's a fraction of a fraction of a percent. So I think that's- What, per that, what percent of people do you think use contraceptives perfectly? Uh, probably not Probably not the majority of people, but again, just because you don't, people don't do something well doesn't mean that it's ineffective. That's like, okay, well, how many people do you think wear speed, uh, seat belts? Well, not a lot, but if you do wear a seat belt because you're worried about safety, seat belts generally right. work. So we can't look at like, well, a lot of people are dumb and don't know how to do So therefore that thing in of itself doesn't work. We have to evaluate the thing based on its merit and not the, I guess, the average dumb who's trying to do that thing. Right, but that's comparing a device that uh, alleviates harm in a certain situation that does not, it does not uh, cause you or motivate you to engage in this thing that could cause the harm in the first place. So the point in me asking, and I think you and I would agree, the majority of people do not use contraceptives perfectly. That's important because when uh, places like the Centers for Disease Control talk about the failure rates of contraceptives, they compare the perfect use method, perfect use, like 0.02%, 1%, 2%, and the actual use, which can be as high as 23%. So there, I think the risk becomes more. You're correct. There are some contraceptives that can uh, make it very unlikely for women to become pregnant, like IUDs or intrauterine devices. But these, many of these uh, kinds of contraceptives, uh, you said there are ones that don't cause health harms to women. I would say the IUD certainly does. It causes a perpetual infection within the uterus to prevent the woman from becoming pregnant. So once again, then she has to undertake uh, this kind of a risk. And I would say if you care about a woman in a relationship, I don't know why you would have them undertake that risk, use birth control, which is a class one carcinogen. I, I, I just am not in favor of that. Yeah. Okay. So let's go one at a time. So there are definitely health issues when, when it comes to uh, like birth control pills, right? That's some women experience. I don't even think it's the majority of women, but it's, it's a significant percentage of women, but that's why they've developed much better form of birth control, right? So the probably, I think the one that not to put my, my personal business out there too much, but I think the one that my girlfriend uses, cause she's super big into health is the one that's like, 
it, like they put it inside your vagina, I guess, and it, like works uh, more mechanically to prevent, uh, I don't know, a baby. Again, I don't know the exact science of it, but I know she's super big into health. And that one specifically, she like raves about. Also, there are advantages also to some women for using birth control. I've heard this time and time again. I know some women who are actually not having sex who take birth control. It clears up their acne. It uh, you know makes their periods a lot better. Uh, it modulates their hormone cycles. So birth control can be good or bad. And also a lot of it is based on which one is being used for which woman. But again, that's a little bit of an aside. I guess my question to you would be, what percentage of risk would you be comfortable with uh, when it came to premarital sex? Like, it would be 0.0001%. Like, what would be, I think, at what point would you say, okay, the risk is negligible? Well, I don't, I don't use a risk reward element to that when it comes to sex because I'm making a moral argument. I'm saying just what sex is for. And I'm asking, what do children have a right to? Like, what kind of things am I going to do to place a child at risk of something? Uh, so there is a, a pragmatic argument that one can make. Oh, well, if it's, you know, point a hundred zeros and a one, it's never going to happen. Then I would say that that's something that's a, a negligible risk. It's something you don't have to be concerned about. But the probability of creating a child out through sex, even if you use contraceptives, is not negligible. It happens every day to people. About 13% of people who go to Planned Parenthood seeking an abortion were regularly and consistently using contraceptives. So I would say that it's it's certainly not negligible given the real world data. Uh, but I would say that I'm, I'm making more of a moral argument that a child has a right to his mother and his father. So I, I, would, I, I would hope you would agree with that, that a child has a right to be raised by his mother and father in a married, stable home, uh, and to do something that could jeopardize that, that right that they have by creating them outside of that context, uh, I would say that it's, it's always wrong to do that, regardless of the risk, and the risk never approaches an infinitesimal point. It's always a, a decent or understandable risk, and it's just something you shouldn't do to a child, and many children have been harmed in coming into existence in these unstable kinds of unions. It's not fair to them. Um, I would argue that it's more optimal to have children while you're married, but I don't think a child has some kind of an alienable right, the child that's not even born yet or is not even embryo yet. Do you think it's immoral for a married couple over 30 to have sex? No. Because if we're following this logic, we all know that when people have sex later on in life, like 30s, the chance right. for birth defects and all kinds of, you know, chronic health issues significantly increases, right? So by that logic, then it would also be, if we're looking at pragmatic, then it would also be wrong for people over the age of 30 or 35 to have sex because that child, if it comes out, is significantly more likely to be sickly, right? Or to have all kinds of health issues, all kinds of mental issues. So well, let me let me address that argument. Uh, one that would more apply to women having having sex over the age of thirty five, but even there, it's not an astronomical risk. Number two, you haven't violated the child's rights because, and this gets into a philosophical issue called the problem of non identity. That <clears throat> can you harm someone who does not exist yet? Uh, and the answer is. You can harm them depending on whether they would have existed otherwise. So, uh, for example, I think you would agree that if you have a pregnancy and you have a fetus, if you drink a bunch of alcohol and the child has fetal alcohol syndrome, then that child has been harmed. Even if you don't think the fetus is a person yet, you shouldn't drink while you're pregnant, you know, or, or even just or just taking even a born child and you do something and they become disabled. You've you've hurt and you've harmed a person who exists and could have that same person could have existed without the disability. That's the issue, whether they're a, a fetus or a born infant there. If you do something to them, it's wrong because that same person could have existed without the disability. The problem though, is that let's say you have sex at the age of 35 and a child comes into existence who has down syndrome. I would say you have not harmed that child because your only alternative action would be to not have sex. But in this case, you would not have the same child without Down syndrome. That particular child would not have existed at all. So it's either a choice between non-existence or existence with some kind of disability. But 
they haven't been they haven't been harmed in that respect. But by that uh, logic, if the parents were more responsible, they would just have the child earlier on in life instead of focusing on their career. No, but it, it would it would have been a if you have sex earlier, it, w- it would not have been the same child. That's why brothers and sisters are not identical. If it's different sperm and it's different egg. Now, actually, if I steel man this, I'll jump back over to your side. Sure. Uh, one could one can <laughs> one can make a similar argument if people have premarital sex that a child will come into existence uh, that same child. Uh, but I would say that the the harm that is caused to them is something that is within the it is within the control of the parents who generate the child. Uh, it is within their power to be able to be married and to provide for a child that comes from their union uh, a marital relationship. And they could provide that before they have sex with this and cause this particular individual to come into existence. So I would say it's not comparable to the Down syndrome case where the parents have less control over that child coming into existence free from that kind of disability. Asking me, do I want to get married? Yeah. Um, if, I, if I was to ever have a kid, I probably would get married. Uh, at this point in my life, I don't see any benefit to me getting married to my girlfriend. Uh, it just I just don't see any point of involving the government in our relationship. Uh, I feel like our relationship can be just as close without that piece of paper. And yeah, it just seems like to me, it's like, it's something that can hurt me potentially, but I don't see how it can help me. Well, do you ever, do you ever see yourself breaking up with your girlfriend? I don't see it, but it's a possibility. Like, would you want to be with her for the rest of your life? Yeah. If all things go well, then yeah, that would be nice. What do you mean if all things go well? Meaning that if we don't, you know, have any like significant issues, if she doesn't betray me, if, you know, whatever, if she doesn't change and become a totally different person, then yeah, that would be nice. I would, I would like to, I think she feels the same way, but we're not, I don't think I'm naive enough to say like, it's, you know, we're going to be together forever. It's like, no, we don't fucking know what's going to happen. Five, so 10 so years now. you guys, so you two have a, a conditional love in your relationship where you'll, you'll love and be with her provided she meets certain conditions. All love outside of like parents and children is conditional. Like you will love your wife a lot less if she cheats on you, whether or you might not love her at all. So all love is conditional. No, uh, no, I will always love my wife. And even if she cheats on me, I'm going to be angry. But love means to will the good. So here, if she commits adultery, then I would encourage her to um, to confess that, to own up to it to seek therapy and counseling to change her behavior so that doesn't happen again and urge her to do acts that would repair the damage that's done to our marriage because I love her and I want her to free of this bad thing that, you know, this bad thing that she's done. But I, but the essence of marriage, though, what makes it such a beautiful thing and why one reason I would say married people are happier is that you have chosen to make this this promise. It's not not some kind of calculated business decision but rather saying, I love you so much. I love you. I will take you as you are, no matter what happens. Even if you end up in a permanent vegetative state, I will make sure that you are cared for because I love you. And if you can find somebody who has that feeling for you, then wouldn't you want to marry him? Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. If you would like more resources on these particular issues, especially how to explain them to your kids, my co-author Layla Miller and I wrote a great book on that called Made This Way. Be sure to check that out. And thank you guys so much. Have a great day.